So I just want to say good morning again to everyone. Um, I hope you all enjoy the first day of presentations and the panelists. I, I want to I won't take up a lot of your time this morning. I would like to take a moment to thank you all for attending and for actively participating and engaging with us um, in this first annual symposium. I would also like for you to, to make sure that, and you'll hear this from several of us, that you take a moment to provide um, provide us with some feedback and questions that you may have that would um, you know, in, increase our, our ability to, to meet the needs of the community um, for an administration um, for our next symposium. So please, please um, give us any suggestions you may have. Like yesterday, we have some wonderful speakers and a phenomenal panel discussion for you today. Today, we're gonna to spend some time um, intentionally speaking on the needs of, um, of female students. Um, and I'm, I'm using the word formerly incarcerated and or system impacted, but like Victoria reminded us yesterday is they would like to be considered um, just rising scholars. But just for the sake of our conversation, I'm just, I use that term. And before I move forward, I want all of you to take a moment um, to breathe. I would like you to think of a time where you were not your best. And we all, we're all human, so we've all had that time, right? Think about who was there to support you and to encourage you during that, that period or that moment or that season. I'm a, I'm a hoop junkie, so I use a lot of sports analogies, right? So I don't know about all of you, but um, I know that some of my biggest supporters were those I met um, during my college <laughs> period of my life. Um, and, a lot, and most of them were people that I met on the college campuses. From my basketball coach, Dave King, um, and, and I'm aging myself a little bit. I graduated in 87. I still call him twice a, twice a month, if not more. Um, he's like my father figure. To my teammates, um, particularly one of my best friends, um, Meg um, Sanders, um, who is now a coach at ASU, who I talk to almost on a weekly basis. To our dining hall manager um, on campus, Wanda, who's um, since has passed on, may she rest in love, but who, understood that um, I was, I didn't have money. And then we, often our practices would go past the time to eat and she would save me uh, food. So I would be able to, I would be able to go. And people didn't know that. I mean, a lot of people don't know that to this day that I said that she would always save me a, um, a to-go plate knowing that um, I didn't have money to get food after, after practice ran late. To my resident assistants, um, who's a RA in our dorm, um, Rebecca, so I think it's important and two, I, well, I, got, I can't leave this, my, one of my favorite people out my, in my grad school, um, who was my professor uh, in my school of social work, Susan Chandler, who kind of grounded me in um, understanding the power that, you know, the power of words and understanding reading. So I think it's important for all of us as educators to understand how impactful we are and can be to someone on campus. I also want to encourage you to become comfortable with being uncomfortable in, in some of these spaces, especially doing, doing some of these trying times, not just with the pandemic, but we have a lot of um, convers we have a lot of conversations in regards to race and equity going on. So it's okay to be uncomfortable with, you know, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. If some of you have time, watch on YouTube, Lovey Ajay. Um, she does a TED talk on being comfortable being uncomfortable. It's one of my favorite videos to show at the beginning of a class um, before I teach. To me, that is how um, the collective work begins. So I wanna thank you all for, and, and I wanna encourage you to enjoy the symposium and I wanna encourage you again, to please um, provide feedback to us. Thank you. Thank you for that very powerful opening uh, remark, Dr. Little. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about and reflect. And I also want to encourage uh, the colleagues, the friends, the community members in the audience to 
Um, consider uh, joining in Dr. Little, myself and others and reflecting on our experience over the past day and just our experience in general, um, especially with what Dr. Little laid out. Um, again, appreciate those thoughtful opening remarks. Um, I do have a, a couple of uh, things I wanna share with uh, the audience, a couple of reminders really. Um, I um, first wanna give uh, gratitude and thanks to, to the entire planning committee for the Rising Scholars Student Success Symposium. Um, a lot of work has gone into this event and um, forgive me if you heard this yesterday, but I understand we also have colleagues that are joining us uh, for the first time today, but we really planned uh, on doing this event last year, um, actually right right before the pandemic, right after the pandemic happened. So um, really the planning for this symposium has been in the works for about two years now. And um, although we couldn't have this event in person, uh, we felt that it was critical um, given the, the experience barriers and uh, opportunities uh, concerning uh, carceral impacted and uh, formerly incarcerated students we knew that it was just too far too important just to simply cancel um, this event. So I wanted to provide a little bit of context about the, the background of this event and also give credit to um, where it should be given. That, that is to my colleagues, Dr. Little uh, has just been uh, so instrumental in the uh, execution of this symposium and putting it together. And uh, I very much appreciate everyone for all that because that allows us to all engage in a learning space together to learn how to better serve and meet the needs of carceral impact and informal incarcerated students on, on campus. Um, I, I'm also very grateful and, and um, thankful that we are, Fresno City College is one of 50 colleges in the state. And um, as a lot of you know, there are 116, well, 117 now with Madera Community College, uh, the newest community college in the system. Um, so we're one of 50 community colleges to uh, receive funding through uh, a grant through the chancellor's office to operate the Rising Scholars Program. And like, like any grant, right, there, there's a sunset date. There's a timeline when that grant's gonna come to an end. Um, however, what I do wanna share with all of you that I have been working with um, several colleagues, um, inclu including Dr. Pimentel uh, and Dr. Little alike, among others, to secure additional funding because we're having conversations about um, sustaining this program, right? Not just um, uh, using funding that has a, a sunset date or a timeline that's gonna finish. We wanna make sure that the programs we create for carceral impacted and, and formerly incarcerated students isn't just a one-time thing, but it's something that is going to exist because we know that it's, it's necessary. We know that it provides transformational experiences and that's something that we we intend to name to do. So um, keep an eye out for that, for more information to come through college announcements, but that is something we are definitely focusing on. I also uh, want to um, emphasize the importance of what Dr. Little talked about. I, I know you all received either an email or um, a link in the sessions that you attended yesterday about the session and symposium surveys. Those are extremely important and I really can't oversize, overemphasize um, the, the importance of completing those. One, we extremely value your experience in this symposium and we wanna know um, what that looked like. Equally important, we wanna know how we can improve this event next year because we certainly are gonna have this event next year. We're gonna do it again. This is the inaugural event, um, but just like we wanna sustain the Rising Scholars Program, we also aim to sustain, uh, I'm sorry, the, the program, we aim to sustain this symposium. So um, what better way to improve the way that we deliver and provide the symposium to, to colleagues and community members alike um, than getting your feedback. So please be sure to take the time to fill out that survey and uh, uh, be candid about your experience because that's one of the best ways that we can learn from you and how to improve the way we roll this out for the next year. So um, we very much appreciate that. I also want to remind everyone um, that there, there will be access to the uh, keynotes and breakout session videos on our Fresno City College professional development YouTube channel. Um, it's, it's not available yet. Um, it's going to take our professional develop office uh, some time 
to upload those videos. Um, I, I thought it was a, a simple matter of, hey, you drag something and upload it. But um, I found out it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. So with that being said, I also want to give a lot of gratitude and appreciation to my colleague, Susie Nitzel, um, who really has been behind the scenes. I know a lot of you haven't seen her or heard her much, but um, if it were not for Susie Nitzel, the reality is we would not be able to have this virtual format and we also wouldn't have a virtual format that is running so smoothly. We've had a little hiccups here and there naturally, right? But beyond those few hiccups, it's been, been very, very smooth. So I just want to tip my hat off to Susie. Thank you so much for your help. Um, and again, uh, we'll have those uh, videos uploaded in the, the coming days or over the next week. Um, that's the goal. And I, I believe Susie will drop a link to our professional development YouTube channel for the college. Go ahead and click on that. You can save it or you can add it to your favorites in your, your, um, your browser of choice and you can access that later to see the, the videos. Um, I also wanna encourage you to, um, to go to that YouTube channel once we upload the videos and watch and listen to breakout sessions that you didn't participate in. That's one of the beautiful things about um, the virtual format and having the YouTube platform is that it provides additional opportunities for, for learning and critical reflection. So uh, again, I do wanna encourage you to do that. Um, in a similar vein, I also wanna encourage those of you that um, are participating today and participated yesterday to share your learning experience and your reflection with others and encourage other colleagues, friends, community members, educators, people within your network and within your circle, encourage them to, to look at and to watch the, the videos that we're gonna upload to YouTube because that really captures the essence of this symposium. We're trying to provide learning opportunities for everyone to, to learn how to better serve and meet the needs of carceral impacted and formerly incarcerated students, right? And in part, in order to do so, that requires us to think critically about our own positions of power influence and agency that we all occupy and how we're using those factors to better meet the needs of formerly incarcerated students. And you have to contextualize the lived experiences of carceral impact and formerly incarcerated students. And our symposium has provided several opportunities for folks to do so. So again, please, uh, we encourage you to share the resources uh, via YouTube to, uh, with other colleagues and, and other uh, folks. So um, now I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to um, Victoria Rocha. Um, Victoria is one of our peer mentors in the Rising Scholars program. Um, she, wow, uh, she's amazing. Uh, she's a superstar. She's a rock star. And uh, with that, I get to turn it over to, to Victoria and it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the second day. And thank you for joining us yesterday. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Cassandra Little. Um, Dr. Little has her master's degree in social work, her PhD in counseling educational psychology, and was recently promoted to intern CEO of Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce and Chamber Foundation. She believes that education is a pathway to intellectual and financial freedom. Dr. Little is committed to supporting and advocating for formerly incarcerated and system impacted students. Her current research interest is focusing on how mass incarceration has impacted women and mothering. Um, Dr. Little has been a major influence in my life, a mentor, a supporter, an encourager. Um, she has taught me so much and it, we are just honored to have her with us here today. Can you please join me in welcoming Dr. Cassandra Little? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Victoria. Um, Victoria is most definitely one of my favorite people um, in the world um, for several reasons. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm so glad that um, I'm able to participate in this process. We're starting off a little early. Um, so um, I, I, I kind of want to just kind of take a 
take a moment um, before I start my presentation and um, to you know get you all kind of on the mindset that you know where I where I'm at. There's a lot going on in our in our world um, today. Like I was just talking with our team prior to us logging on, and there's a lot of things that are heavy on my heart, right? Um, and so um, I want to you know I just want us to kind of be conscious of what's what's going on um, in our world and and kind of the uh, you know just just know that you know like I I know that there we can bring we can bring love and peace and 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 some sanity to what you know to our to our spaces and and I know for me being a part of um, Fresno City College is the the student equity department has been, pretty much at this phase of my life, a, a, a big life-saving piece for me. So I, I just want to thank all of them for, you know, enter, letting me enter into their space and, and welcoming me, me with open arms. But today I, I really want to focus on the journey of the female um, formerly incarcerated student. And like I said, I'm using that term just for the sake of my presentation. Um, but, you know, when we hear the word um, mass incarceration or incarceration, we immediately think of a male. Um, and so we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about and um, show my presentation of how um, it has impacted the, uh, you know, the women, um, women in our communities and in our society. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Please, I really want to make this interactive. So if you have any questions, please put those in the, in the um, chat box. Um, that this that makes my process this process for me easier. Um, uh, you know, I also teach at Fresno State and Fresno Pacific, and I and since we've been entering into this virtual space, uh, what I found is sometimes I get I get bored with my own voice. So, so if you have any questions, um, I you know I, I I don't mind engagement. I think that's what's um, you know I think that's how we can get this flowing easier. And I use the slides just to kind of guide my guide myself. Um, um, with this topic because I can go on and on and on. Okay, so like I said, is uh, today we're gonna focus on, I'm gonna focus on um, the female student on campus and some of the, some of the things, the issues and challenges that, um, that um, they may be faced, they may have faced um, while incarcerated and at what they face as they um, enter into back into their communities and families. Now I will not be able to do this this justice. It's there's um, I am I have written um, several pa several papers on um, the topic, and there's and each time I write on it, there's something else comes up. So um, the you know the challenges are multifaceted, and so I just just want you to understand that this is not all inclusive. Okay. Um, so we're going to I'm going to give like a brief overview of um, the issues of incarceration, the intersection of female incarceration and trauma, um, impact of incarceration on mothering, which is um, one of my um, my 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 interests right now. And and uh, and then I'm going to take a little break. Um, I I couldn't decide if I was going to do some music or poem, but I wrote I'm going to read a little short poem just to break it up. And then I'm gonna talk about what we're here for is the higher education and female student. And then just give like five action items and then we'll conclude, okay? So, you know, I've introduced myself several times on Dr. Cassandra Little. Um, I, I, what's interesting, I'm currently in the, um, at Fresno State in the criminal justice department. I also teach at, um, Fresno Pacific in the um, uh, social work department, and I, I have to tell, I have to say I I enjoy both. I um I, I love the teaching space. It's um it's it's in my it's I say my my first passion tied with poetry and storytelling, and so I'm happy that um that's that I have the ability to do that. So this seminar is intentionally focused on the impact of incarceration on women and how the experience intersects with the female student journey in higher education. Um, like I said, I'll briefly discuss mass incarceration because that in itself will take, that's like a, a long-term conversation, re-entry, formerly incarcerated women, mothering, economic equity, and education. And then, uh, you know, I will always ask myself a question prior to entering any um, 
presentation I'm going to do, why is this topic important? And I say that we cannot embrace the and discuss student equity on campus, like I said before, without the discussions around the impact of mass incarceration on Black, Indigenous people, um, students of color, and I, I, I specifically say women. Because a lot of times, like I said, women, women are, are we're the invisible topic. We're, we're left out of those conversations. So I want to be intentional. The other thing, the first thing I like to talk about is language. You know, I know I, you know, I grew up with hearing stick and stones may break your bones, but words would never hurt you. But we know um, for sure that um, that that's not true. So language, and I think um, Danny talked about this yesterday in his keynote, um, is very essential and it's important because words can kill. Words can give life. Um, as someone who loves to write, I know that um, they're either poison or fruit. So you you choose. Um, and I know as a researcher, you know, as I read a lot of um, journals, the, you know, the language um, uh, to me, some of that needs to change. And I know with my writing, I try to, I no try, I'm intentional about how um, the language and kind of changing some of the, the narratives that we place on and labels that we place on, um, on formerly incarcerated and system impacted um, community members. So I try to avoid using ex-felon, ex ex-con, ex-offender, ex-prisoner, ex-inmate. Now I know, and we've talked about this a lot um, within our, our, our group um, as we were organizing the symposium that uh, you know some of the language is used and necessary um, because when you write in a grant um, and as a grant writer, you typically have to mirror their, their language. So um, my goal is to um, work on, to continue to change that. Um, um, that language. So some of the phrases that you'll hear um, throughout that you heard yesterday and you'll hear throughout today are, you know, persons or individuals, uh, just people um, with prior justice um, system involvement, uh, person or individuals previously incarcerated, persons or individuals with justice history or formerly incarcerated. So, and if you, if you think about the tone, um, you know, it makes a difference. And so when, if we're talking about language, I was just gonna be frank. A lot of times when I hear um, inmate or felon or ex-con, to me, it's the same as hearing the N-word. So it, it just means it resonates that deeply with me. Um, so I just wanted to um, take a moment and discuss that. But I think Danny did a great job of um, explaining that yesterday also. You, you also, and I tried not to, um, just assume people understand a lot of the terms that are used, um, especially on college campuses, because being someone on a college campus, we have our own language and I understand that. So you hear system impacted. And so I just kind of wanted to give a little definition of that. Um, this is not inclusive, all, I mean, all, I mean, this is just a brief overall view of it. Is a person who is legally, economically, or familiarly affected in a negative way by the incarcerated, um, of a close um, relative. System impacted also includes people who have been arrested or convicted without incarceration, okay? So one of the things that has, has, has troubled me that why this is like a major, major um, issue in my life is that mass incarceration in, uh, in the United States, we have the highest incarceration rate um, in the nation. And, and not, you know, being I mean, who we are and, and, uh, and when you look at this graph, you know, it, it always baffles me. I, I love to, you know, I'm visual. So, I, you know, I can show you the numbers and sometimes numbers don't resonate with people. But if you look at that graph and see how, um, how we stand out um, with other uh, countries, even underdeveloped countries, it's, it's amazing to me how much we incarcerate um, our citizens. Now, one of the topics that's that's critical that we're talking about today is is the how we're the mass incarceration of women. Now, there has been, and it's there's been, and even though that if you look at proportionally, yeah, there's more men that are incarcerated than women, but the incarceration of women has increased extensively um, over you know 
um, especially since 1980, since the war on drugs. But um, the criminal justice system and some of the laws that have been passed have has um, increasingly impacted women. And what I what I try to remind people is that um, when you incarcerate a woman, you're incarcerating a family, um, and you're impacting a child. And so that's that's something that I think in regards to the, when we talk about conversations of uh, mass incarceration that we have to keep in, and it's improving. You have you have a lot of people who are talking more about female incarceration, but we we have to keep we have to keep elevating this this topic because what happens is that's someone who's a social worker. As we are incarcerating mothers, we're having kids going to foster care. And one of the studies I did, the analysis that I did is that uh, I looked at how, um, the, the, how the numbers of women being incarcerated started increasing and so it did within child welfare with kids going into um, the foster care system, okay? And, and that and that's a then that's a different conversation but um because as as we know and if you don't know foster care also is another um, pathway to the justice system and it also impacts um families um, particularly community of colors disproportionately So one of the other things I you know, talk about, and like I said, this is brief, I'm not gonna do it justice, but there's a lot of research on the intersection of female incarceration and trauma. And, um, and so I just kind of wanna give a, a brief um, discussion on, you know, uh, definition on trauma. And, and trauma is um, events um, include physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, terrorism and war, domestic violence witnessing violence against others and accidents and natural disasters. They can result in serious stress and detrimental consequences for survivors and their family. So what many studies have found is that 86% or more of women are often incarcerated because their experiences with trauma and domestic violence. Okay, and, and so that's, I mean, to me, that's, that's, that's really, that's an important statistic and that's an important place to start because um, for those of you who don't know about the criminal justice system, once women are entered into that, that system, they're re-traumatized over and over again. So one of the uh, one of the subjects or topics you 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 hear was you know a lot of um, conversations about is gender responsive services. Um, and, and, and so I just wanted to give like a, just a brief synopsis of why um, we need gender responsive services. Um, formerly incarcerated women, incarcerated women, especially um, women of color have much higher rates of unemployment and homelessness and are less likely to have a high school education compared to formerly incarcerated men. And most incarcerated women like that, um, we'll, we'll let you know in the next slide are, are mothers and frankly, they're the primary caretakers of their children. So the importance of family reunification, um, and which is in many studies have looked at among the others cannot be overstated, especially given that um, trauma experienced by children um, when they are separated from their parents, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impact of incarceration on mothering. So, and this is this study is uh, about uh, three years old, but over sixty percent of imprisoned women are are mothers of children of the age, under the age of eighteen. And like I um, stated prior, um, when when mothers are um, incarcerated, you know, it, unless a family step in, um, a lot of their kids end up in foster care. And once they're incarcerated, what happened with child welfare is that um, you know the court the court takes over, uh, the system takes over. And so the kids are still progressing through the system. So if you have a mother who has a, let's say she had to do four to six years, by the time her time is up and, and she's not able to fight um, using her um, parental rights, that child could have, um, could use, could have lost their, um, that, that parent could have lost their parental rights while they're incarcerated. Now, as a, um, I spent a big part of my life as a social worker um, working in child welfare. 
And, um, and I worked with a lot of, lot of um, majority of the youth I worked with were kids who parental rights were terminated. Um, and our goal and our hope is always that they'll be adopted, but um, majority of the time is particularly for youth of color, this doesn't happen. So they end up growing up and um, foster care and just aging out of the system. Okay. So this just goes on to talk about a little bit more about how um, incarcerated mothers often lose contact with their children due to far distances and the high expenses of having family members visit. Now, um, this, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of agencies who are tackling this issue um, for mothers and, and families and, and youth in particular, and, um, and trying to ensure that visitation happens and that bond continues. But a lot of times when women are incarcerated, their support and their familial support, so familial connections are, um, are, are, are just dropped. And it's, it's, kind of, it's different for, particularly for males. Um, um, you know, the studies have shown that males receive a lot more um, support than females do for um, whatever reasons. A lot of it is, you know, sometimes parents expect more from the, 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 the moms than they do from, from the, the, male, the male child. And, and so it's more of a disappointment. So there's a lot of disconnection or it's the other way around. The, the, the mother feels a lot of shame and guilt and, um, and kind of that, that those relationships are severed. So a lot of times the, the, the women don't get visits um, with, their, with their children as much as, um, as men do. And also when men are incarcerated, the women are the ones who will you know, make sure the visits happen with the kids. And so when it's the other way around, it doesn't, um, it doesn't happen as much. And why is all that important? All that is important um, because um, what, what we know for a fact is at least 95% of the people who are, are um, incarcerated are gonna be released at home at some point. So a lot of those women who are um, incarcerated and our mothers and parents, our aunts and sisters and daughters are gonna come home, right? And, and so um, and reentry to me is an essential part of, um, it's, it's an essential part of what, I, what I, I feel that as a community that we need to, we need to focus on, knowing that 95% of, um, of our um, community members are gonna be coming home. We need, to, we need to create the space for female, especially the women that are incarcerated to be reclaimed by our community. Um, we need to help them reclaim their space with their families and their kids. Um, and what we found is, um, uh, if you look at research, is higher education plays a big part in that, particularly community colleges, um, because like a, community colleges are easier, easier, easier to access, um, um, and so they play a big role in um, reentry. That was one of the main reasons why I was um, so excited to partner with and collaborate with um, Fresno City College on on reentry and um, and, and kind of blending my two passions, which is reentry and education. Because like I said before, I do feel like education is, um, is, is a pathway to liberation um, in many ways. And so it's, it's a perfect marriage for um, women who are um, system impacted. It has been um, empirically proven to decrease recidivism. Um, it's when you, with education um, on campus and, and we've heard from the panel yesterday, and we'll hear from a panel of um, uh, young women today, it enhances self-efficacy. Because one of the main thing is not, is knowing, is believing that you can do something. Um, taking that chance to walk on that, take a step on that campus. Even if you've taken classes um, while you were incarcerated, um, we still have to create pathways for, for, for women once they have um, re-entered, um, their communities and their families to walk onto our campuses and feel okay with doing that. Because, uh, you know, what we need to understand is that the, the shame and the, the work that, they, that are before them, a lot of the women, once they come home, the first thing they want to do is, is um, re-engage with their kids. So they have to do that. Legally, they have to re-engage with probation. So they have to do that. Um, a lot of times, um, 
they may not have the family support. So they have to, you know, figure out where they're, where they're going to, their housing. So there's so many integral parts that, um, that, that, you know, you know, men have also, but for women that are a little different that come into play, especially, particularly when we want, we're talking about, we want, we want to have, um, women who have been impacted on our campuses. We have to, we have to have paved that way for, to make it easier for them to, to come on and to be successful. We also know um, through research that um, higher education it increases self-esteem. You know, I, I let people, I'm pretty transparent. I let people know that, you know, I grew up in East Palo Alto, um, California. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with East Palo Alto. It, it, you know, it's been gentrified a, a, a huge bit, but um, I grew up in the 80s, right? Doing, um, uh, doing the you know, crack epidemic, war on drugs. And um, you know, I, I grew up seeing a lot of things. Our, our, our neighborhoods were highly policed. Um, and and I, I, I was intent on, I wanted to go to college. I went, I went, I would go to my, I went, I remember the last time I went to my um, college, uh, my, I'm sorry, my high school counselor and um, I played basketball. I was, I was pretty, I was pretty good. Um, I, and I, I went to my, I seen a lot of my teammates that were, you know, talking about college. Well, I didn't have any of that, um, that modeling. I, I was raised by grandparents. And so I you know, went to my, there's my junior year, end of my junior year, I went to my, 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 my high school counselor and I said, hey, I want to go to college. And he just looked me dead in my eye and told me I need to figure out something else to do. And so, um, I, you know, from that moment forward, you know, I, you know I, I told myself I was never going to let anyone tell me what I could not do. Um, and, and, and I pushed forward from there. Um, and, and what I've learned throughout my, my journey with education, and that's why this work is so important for me and working with um, women who have been impacted, um, is that education, um, I'm not saying that I remember everything that was in the book, but education really in increased my self-esteem and increased my opportunities and requires employment. Um, and um, being the, the eldest of five, um, um, sisters, it also, you know, put me in a position where I can encourage other family members to, to walk another path. And I think Danny spoke on that also yesterday. So education is, 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 a, is an extremely important pathway towards um, not only improving your, you know, your own economic well-being, but in, I, I say it's another way of, of creating family generational wealth even if that wealth is um, a knowledge and intellectual, right? So the other thing that education does is instills um, confidence in a person to be able to deal with rejection. And, and that's important for um, reentry because you're gonna, you know, I think in this world today, like I say, we're gonna get a lot of no's anyway, but when you're reentering, no can be, can be very, very traumatic. So, you know, if you're on, on, on a college campus and you're, you know, kind of, you, you, you're in, and, I, and I, can be, I consider a college campus, that's why I went to my PhD, I love school, <laughs> college campus to be a community, um, you can handle rejection. So you can go to, um, you know, Array, Dr. Ramirez and say, hey, I, I said, no, you have someone you can go to. You can go to um, Hugo, you can go, you have people you can go to um, that understand your circumstances. You can go to um, Mark McNiff and, um, and Monique. Um, there's different people on campus who you know that are there to support you. And you can go to them and, and talk to them about how it feels to have someone um, tell you no and have them push you forward to keep trying, okay? So my main point is the education, not just education, the education community is is the difference be between giving formerly incarcerated people a life in which they can sustain their existence and one in which they can thrive and break the cycle of incarceration for generations to come. Because I feel that that's, for me, that's, that's the job right there. Um, that's, that's where the work lies, is to stop the cycle. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to access for economic equity, which is, which is the other um, main point for me. So the, the 
Another point is um, college, you know, should advocate for state sustainable funding streams to increase the quality of higher education for formerly incarcerated students. Now I know, you know, we we say that that's for every student, and and yes, I'm I, I I'm for that also. But today we're talking about system impacted students and students who have been impacted, um, and I think it's okay to be intentional. Um, I, like I said, I think that this 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 issue. When we talk about equity, um, and I've said, and I'll say it over and over again, and we're talking issues of race, we cannot talk about any of those without talking about the impact of incarceration and mass incarceration um, and systemic oppression. Okay. Um, the, one of the other things is systemically dismantling discrimination in the college community. Now, I, you know, I've been I've been a big part of um, the, the college community on both ends. Um, as a, as a student athlete, as a student, and now as a um, professor, um, as a mentor, and, a, and as an advocate. And I just want us to know that we all, and, and it's okay, we all have a lot of work to do. And that's okay. Um, my thing is that's, that's what we're here for. Um, the work, we have a lot of work to do. The work is not done. And that's what our symposium is for. It's, the, it's a call to action. It's a call to let's, let's do this work. And yet we're intentionally speaking about formerly incarcerated stu students because um, that's our call to action today. Um, but I think college campuses are one of the most empowering, um, especially the, particularly the community college because they're right in the middle of the community, hence community college. Um, um, we, have, we, we, we have the impetus to make such an impact on not just uh, you know, those who are um, right there you know, on our campuses, but we have tentacles. If we're if we're working with those individuals on our campuses, look our look at the Victorias, look at the Alexes. There's many more of them um, out there um, that we need to embrace and um, bring it to our community, um, so that when when we release them out to the community, they're ready to do the work. Ongoing training and education of college personnel and staff on how to support formerly incarcerated students on college campuses. And so that's where we're starting with this. And, um, and, and I say that this with well intentions. Um, I, you know, I've have, um, I've been in Central Valley now for about two years and I've had st students that I've sent over to, you know, all the colleges. And it's just been, to me, it's been incredible. It's been wonderful to be able to say, to have a person that I can send them to um, I could do a warm handoff. There's nothing like a warm handoff for someone who um, you want their first experience on that campus to be meaningful. Because if we let them walk away, they may not come back. And, you know, the one thing that I like to remind people is that, um, you know, we, you know, we all live next to each other. We're all tethered to each other. So we, we want to be proximate with, with everyone who um, and within our communities, uh, not distant. The other thing I think is higher education must put people who are impacted by the, the system, criminal justice system at the height of their programming. You know, one of, one of my favorite people, and next year I'm gonna have him come speak at our symposium, his name is Glenn Martin. Um, and he says the closest, the, the the closest to the problem are the, the people that are closest to the problem are the closest to the solution and the furthest from the resources. So that's why I'm very appreciative of the Rising Scholars Program. We try, we try and we want to push them out front to, to guide us on what their what their needs are. And um, and then with the with the with the knowledge and the, the power we have as the administrators and as the, the mentors to guide them to make sure that we can pave a path for them that's easier to gain, um, gain their education and to you know, do some of the things that they're wanting to do. The, you know, throughout my life, and I say I, I've had, um, I'm, I'm, fit, I'm about to be 57 here on April 20th. And you know, I, the one thing, you know, I've, and I've had, you know, I say I've, I probably have like five books of a life, right? But the one thing that I can say that's true for me, um, that I would say to my dying days is that I have lost a lot of things. People can have taken a lot from me, but the one thing that they can never take away is my education. 
And I say it, I say it over and over again. My son hears it all the time. My family members hear it all the time. You can, I can lose everything, but they, my, no one could ever take away from my education. And like Michelle Obama said, it's, it is worth the investment. It has been worth the investment for me. So I, I only have five, but, but because I was like, you know, I don't, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot we can do um, to support female students on campus. Um, and, and a lot of it is the, you know, I think it's, it's great to have like one-on-one -on -one support for female students who are impacted. Um, and, and that's for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of women who have been impacted, like I said, they, they deal with, and I didn't go into a lot of that, they go to the shame of it. Um, a lot of women who are mothers, it's like, you know, I was away from my kids and explaining and telling your story over and over again is, um, you know, it can be troubling and trying, trying within a group setting. So um, providing some of that, if you're, if you're someone on campus and you have a student and um, that's a rising scholar and you have the time and the energy that this just, you know, mentor that student. The other thing that, you know, everyone has talked about is provide a warm handoff for community-based supports. I know within rising, rising scholars, that's a, that's a big part of what we're, we're trying to, um, to build um, on campus because what we know of with all of our students and particularly with our students that are impacted, their lives, their lives happen off campus. So we want some connection um, off campus. And so that's why I'm, I pride myself on being a big part of um, Fresno City College um, campus and community and um, working with um, the rising scholars. When we're talking about financial support, we also, if we can, we can kind of, and I know that um, Fresno City is, uh, has, has started that, but um, we can keep talking about financial support for childcare and housing. And these are issues I know that are universal, but um, like I said, today we're, we're intentionally speaking about students who have been impacted. Um, and then female system, system impacted um, support groups on campus. Yeah, we have a, um, we have the rising scholars group, but I think it's essential to have a group that's set. Um, and that's for me, this next year is to look at, that's one that's you know specifically geared towards the needs of women because the needs are different. And, and you know, we just have, we have to acknowledge that a lot of our systems are structured to meet the, the, male, the, the needs of males um, in crisis. And so um, that's something that I, I really want to um, work on for, and talk a little bit more and do some research on in regards to um, college campuses. And another major um, thing that I say is hire system impacted personnel and mentors. Um, and, and, you know, and college campuses have come, especially in California has come a long ways um, in this issue, but I, we, we still need to continue to talk about it. Um, I know this is one of the, um, one of the issues I'm gonna talk, continue to talk about um, with, with our chancellor and other administrators. I think it's essential for our students to have representation and to know that, hey, I can do that. Um, if they can do it, I can do it too. Um, and so we, we, need to, um, we need to encourage that and not be afraid of that. And my last ask um, is before I answer any questions, so please, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat box is um, the community college and administration, I ask that the community college and administration embrace, and not, not just at Fresno City College, everywhere, embraces the notion that fostering the success of students who are labeled formerly incarcerated is not just the job of the Office of Student Equity, right? It's not just a student equity issue. Even though I'm glad we have a student equity department to, to remind us of that, but this is really a college community issue. And then I just want to end with saying that, you know, I, I truly believe that nobody is free until everybody is free. And that was a quote from Family Lou Hamer. And on that note, I just want to um, end and I want to um, say, you know, thank you for, um, for listening and participating. And um, I will open up to, for any questions, comments, concerns, um, I'm here. Thank you so much, Dr. Lillard.
it looks like we have uh, one question um, in the question and answer box, which I'll read out loud for everyone to hear. Um, but but again, I, I want to encourage um, the audience to please, um, if you have questions for Dr. Little, if you can drop them in the question and answer box, and we'll address those. Um, here, here's the first question, and I may I may have to help with this one, but let's see. Okay. Uh, this is from a faculty at Fresno City College. Do we have data for California community colleges as a system and or Fresno City College specifically of percent of students disaggregated by race and gender who have prior justice involvement? Um, I'll take a stab at that first one if you don't mind, Dr. Little. Oh, yeah. please do. Yeah, so that this is an excellent question, um, essentially asking if we have data on um, uh, the percent of students in the system where our present city college disaggregated by race and gender uh, with prior justice involvement. And uh, the, the short answer is yes, um, we do, um, but it's not um, widely reliable and um, dependable. And the reason is because we have not been uh, tracking um, our students. And by that, I mean, we haven't been coding students. Um, there, there is a, a way to actually code students. There is, there's, a, there's a code as part of the matriculation metrics for the California Community College System. Um, however, we haven't done that as an institution. Um, nonetheless, I know um, several colleagues in our EO, EOPNS uh, department on campus, they do have uh, readily um, data um, that they're tracking with regard to justice involved students. Um, or formerly incarcerated students as we're referring to them for, for today in this symposium. Um, but, but again, that's a, a departmental um, system of, of data tracking, right? We don't have a college-wide system as of yet um, to answer that question. But I also wanna talk about some of the implications and the unintended consequences that, that might come about if we, if we do properly code students um, according to the matriculation metrics. So there's two ways of doing this, right? Um, from a programmatic perspective with the Rising Scholars Program, we can code students on the back end, right, of our system, and we can, we can know the number of students, but that would only give us the number of students who are in the Rising Scholars Program, right? Um, the other and or way to do it is to, um, to do it at the application uh, level. So whether students are applying through CCC Apply or they go to a program and uh, a counselor or, or someone is helping um, a student fill out the application, they would see a box that would say something that, uh, that indicates um, justice involvement or formerly incarcerated, right? But think about the implications of that box. Think about mm -hmm. the stigma. Think about Dr. Little's presentation and, and, and really what you've learned over the past day. By putting a box uh, in the application, that, that can be very traumatizing um, it can be very uh, stigmatizing, further stigmatizing, right? And so th this, it's a really good question that this faculty member asked. Um, and it is something that, that we're exploring. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ugo, is helping me look into this. He's uh, our counselor in the Rising Scholars Program. And uh, we are working with one of our, our campus leads over our Starfish um, platform. Kayla Mann is helping us with that. But, but even there, uh, we found out that it's gonna require more, more folks to be involved with the planning and discussion of how to not not properly code, mm -hmm. not properly, but how to morally, <laughs> right? Yeah. How to morally code system impact and formerly incarcerated students. Because I received an email from the Chancellor's Office, actually, full disclosure, um, about um, how to properly code, right? And it's not about properly, right? It's not about you know a system, a tracking, a data input output. No, it's how do we morally, right? How do we ethically and in a welcoming and inviting way, um, code students. So uh, this is gonna be an ongoing conversation um, that, that my team and others are gonna have, but Dr. Little, what, I'd love to hear your thoughts to, um, about this oh. comment and my response. And you know, as you were talking about that, I was thinking, cause you know, it's like, we gotta strategize about that. I was like, we may be able to find a way of like putting how we can add rising scholars in there and put a tone in there where people will be okay with you know, owning that part of their story. Right. Um, Ray, I forgot, I need to read the poem that I was gonna read. Um, um, That's it's, right, yeah. It just Please. reminded me. <laughs> and it's called A Womanly Smile. And 
it, and this poem is, like I said, it's to me, I, I put myself in a female space um, and a, in a mother space. And so this, this poem is called A Womanly Smile. Um, and it's for years and for centuries, we hidden our pain, tortured, abused, raped, and misused. Our matriarchs, our mothers are nurturing. Our sacrifices aren't honored until we're memorialized and are martyred. Our truths, our responsibilities, our struggles, our collective stories. We're seeing bars as walls, dividing our heart and caging our minds. We're mindful of our heroes, their ups and downs, and wondering how did they survive? They help us feel inspired. They connect us with love. They connect us with our essence. They connect us with our higher self. They connect us with who we are. And at the day, end of the day, a womanly smile can tell it all. So that poem for me uh, is written about the struggle. Um, and for me, in regards to the struggle of an incarcerated mother um, trying to get her way home to her, her, her kids, to her life. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions, Susie? Thank you, Dr. Little. Uh -huh. Yes, Dr. Little, uh, Arnaldo wants to know, in the court of law, is trauma considered prior to judgment or is this overlooked by the jury? So that's a, that's, that's a, that's a very good question. And so now when we talk about trauma and, and, I, and I'm, I'm speaking particularly with, um, in regards to women, you'll see, I say now that they're trying to talk more about the, the trauma that women has, has uh, were in, in regards to domestic violence prior to um, incarceration will come up in trial, but it's not something that is readily looked by, at by the courts unless it's brought up, unless you have the money to have the defense to, to make that a case, right? So um, so it's not something that, that people are looking at, at at a court of law. It's like an after the fact thing. You have researchers like myself that are talking about it and other researchers that are talking about how trauma has um, huge implication on why women are becoming incarcerated. And what we know is that women incarceration, when I, the other point I didn't make, I didn't really make that point in this presentation, but um, you know, a lot of women incarceration has to do with survival crimes. Um, you know, so, you know, it's, it'll be, you know, either they were protecting themselves if it was a, you know, a crime of, of violence, but they were to particularly survival crimes to, to take care of themselves and their kids. And this is a comment more than a question, but related to trauma from Marianne Valentino. My guess is that way more BIPOC students have prior justice involvement than most faculty realize. Mm -hmm. This means that we need to use a trauma-based approach widely. Exactly. And it also, that's a, that's a very good point, but then it also means that there needs to be a commitment through um, I say professional development through uh, college campuses with providing that information to faculty also, right? Um, so it's so to have that space, to have those kind of conversations, especially, I mean, I say every college level, but particularly in a community college level. And um, because, you know, like I said, our the community college um, setting is easiest, you know, to, um, to access initially. So yes, that's a very good point. And Arnaldo asks, what can we do to get more community colleges or the remaining 67 colleges involved with Rising Scholars? I'll let Ray answer that first. Thank you, Dr. Little. Uh, excellent question. It's a great question. Um, I, I think um, there's a couple of responses to that, that question. Um, first, um, you know, this was uh, a pilot, if you will, uh, something that has been championed by Chancellor Eloy Ortiz Oakley, um, who was with us yesterday morning. Uh, this has been a, a very uh, important undertaking of his office. 
but it's also something that has been supported by the state legislature, right? The legislature appropriated the funds for the chancellor's office to determine which 50 colleges to uh, receive those funds. So, um, you know, it, it, was a, it was an application process. I know that, right? When there were only 50 slots. So what that tells me about the funding that each of the college, the, each of the 50 colleges received to operate the Rising Scholars programs is uh, funding is limited, right? Um, nonetheless, what I have heard is that, you know, um, it is possible that there is going to be a, a second round of uh, um, RFAs or uh, requests for applications um, for continued funding for support for the Rising Scholars programs. Um, I'm not sure if that's for the existing 50 uh, already established programs or additional colleges, but I, I think it is a great question that I, I don't have a definitive answer to. Um, and that's something I think that uh, should be really staple at each college, right? Just like, just like uh, there is a student equity policy, right? We have legislation that requires community colleges to maintain a three-year student equity plan as a condition for receiving any funding, state funding, right? Any funding whatsoever, right? Um, so one, one way from a policy perspective to ensure that uh, colleges are, are focused on the rising scholars is to, um, to include some stipulation in the equity policy, uh, given the, the relationship between uh, equity and rising scholars, right? Uh, that includes the rising scholars program. So um, that, that's one way I think to, to further um, enhance and impact the rising scholars program across the community colleges in the system. And I say continue conversations of symposiums, um, forums like this. Um, the, the one thing is, you know, kind of eliminating the stigma. You know, one of my favorite people, Dr. Taylor, and all her presentations, you know, and I learned this from her, so I copied it, is she would ask people, you know, if they knew someone or, you know, or had someone who had been impacted. And over 50% of the people will raise their hand in every space that I've been in. And so, and so we know that this is impactful. This is going on in our community. So kind of breaking the taboo um, with the conversations are essential. And so I know, you know, for us, this is, this is, this is a major way of starting that conversation. Um, and, and to get the other part is getting the, not only just to have the students tell their story, because, you know, that, like I said, after a while that gets that starts traumatizing and traumatizing over and over again, but to, you know, start also sharing their successes to show how important programs like Rising Scholars are for, um, you know, helping them store and um, increasing their, um, their access to employment, um, even moving on to, you know, four-year colleges and, and beyond. Um, we have to start, um, we have to start the conversations there. And, and, and what, like my friend just said, um, Jennifer, uh, to provide additional funds um, is important. You, we, and, we, and we can't say that enough. You can't do it without the dollars. You know, it's hard to do the work. Dr. Little, that's the end of the written questions, but I'd like to try something if you don't mind. Sure. I want to enable the raised hand feature. Sure. And then P, sometimes people, a question is hard to, I know for me, a question is hard to type. Yes. I'd rather ask it. So I have enabled the raise hand feature for our audience. Okay. And okay. if you have a question you'd like to ask live, just raise your hand and I will, um, what Zoom calls, allow you to talk. Sorry, Zoom's words, not mine. And then you can ask Dr. Little or Dr. Ramirez your questions directly. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. There's a little raise hand button icon at the bottom of your Zoom controls. I work with a lot of you. I know you're not shy. Here we go. <laughs> Arnaldo. Arnaldo, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on the Rising Scholars programs in the additional community colleges. If there is a uh, community college who is uh, or that are interested in uh, being part of the Rising Scholars or adopting the program on their campus, who would they reach out to now or how would they start looking into that? When does the, the, uh, the governor, when does he start distributing his funds, if you will? I think that, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say that 
almost every college has um, uh, an equity department or an equity office. In fact, most colleges have uh, a vice president or, or dean of equity, and um, the, the names tend to vary. You know, uh, dean of equity and inclusion, dean of, of equity and um, diversity. There's there's various names, but nonetheless, the equity leaders. Um, almost every community college has an equity leader and or a department, and so I, I think that that's uh, one place to start because uh, the equity leaders across our, our community colleges. They, if, if they don't have the direct answer about how to facilitate such a, a program and process on their campus, um, uh, they will know who to connect the student um, uh, and or community with, right? It could be a colleague in student services and or instruction, but um, I, I definitely would say to, to look up and look for um, the, the college equity leader and department. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, uh, Dr. Little. This is Jennifer Hi. Leahy. Hi. <laughs> it is really great to hear you speak. And I uh, want to start by saying thank you for uh, bringing voice to the women. Um, you know, four to five percent of the prison population, and, and we often go unnoticed and forgotten. And so yes. I, I want to commend you for specifically pointing out that equity requires sometimes for us to. Um, be specific and intentional. Yeah. And yeah. Um, to that point, for programs that are trying to support formerly incarcerated individuals, what do you think is the most important thing, whether it's a program or, or just individuals on a campus? Um, so not necessarily a uh, program like Project Rebound or Rising Scholars, but maybe programs like Career Development Center or SSD or any other program on campus. Um, to what do you think is the most important thing for them to keep in mind in terms of differentiating between services for women and services for men? Well, because yeah. most of the programs being designed, you know, for men, mm -hmm. um, what is intentional? What, what, what should we keep in mind intentionally in trying to service women? That's a, that's a very good um, question, Jennifer. And, and you know, on, on campuses, we struggle with that a lot. And I, you know, for me, I, when I when I think women and, and it's not universal, I always think of you know children. They you know they have families, so time time time. You know a lot of college campuses close. You know services are over at five sometimes. But um, so I, I think keeping in mind that you know we have a lot of parents um, who are who are you know women who are who have, who have come home and and so keeping that in mind and understanding that. Um, um, and having representation also, um, having some uh, female staff, you know, involved to engage with them because a lot of times if it's, you know, is, and if you, if you do, if you, and we're talking about trauma and, um, and women, it's, it's important to have, um, you know, other, other women that, um, that the, you know, that the, the, the female student can, can be able to engage with and engage with, you know, feeling safe. Um, for whatever reason, and um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. There's, I, I can't offhand just, just say, but um, just knowing that we, you know, we have to intentionally understand that um, that we have we have women on campus who who need us to see them, and to support them, and to listen to them, and um, to be open to them, and. What I've what I've seen is that even within our program, you know, you know, I always I I, I own the right to critique, right? Any system that I'm a part of, because I think that's how we get better. Uh, a, a lot of times, the you know, the females start taking the lead and take on too much, and so then you know, other parts of their lives, you know, fail, you know, start falling because women want to to um, women want to. Uh, please, and they want to, you know, they want to do the best they can. So I think we also need to keep in mind and, and help women, uh, the women that are, you know, home, coming home and that our students find balance. Critical, yeah, that's yes. very critical. Yeah, yes, thank sure. you. Yeah. That, I, that was exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, I think that's incredible, so thank you. Yes. 
Um, I just I just wanted to mention that we need to not forget the trans women and sure. trans men and non-binary. For sure. Most definitely. And and that is also an intentional um, conversation that needs to happen. Um, um, for, and on, I mean, on all men of so many levels. Absolutely. Um, so, so thank you for that. Anybody else? Also, maybe you have a question and you're uncertain about asking it because you feel it's inappropriate or you feel like maybe you don't know enough. So I've also enabled in the Q&A the ability to ask your question anonymously. We'd like to think of this as a brave space mm -hmm. where everybody's questions are welcome, but I understand some people don't feel comfortable putting a name to their question. So I've enabled that function. If you'd like to ask in the Q&A or as always raise your hand and ask Dr. Little your question directly. And I don't, I, look, as a, and as an educator, I don't feel like there's a bad question. <laughs> I mean, it's, oh, any, I'd rather for someone to ask than not ask and assume. So while they're gathering their thoughts, Dr. Little, I know if I, my colleague, Monique Reno is here, who's doing a oh, yeah. presentation later on in the day, yes. uh, she would ask, how do we, how do we deal with, or how do we go about changing, ed code currently says, that uh, it does not allow the hiring of those people with uh, serious or violent felons. And I know that's an issue at Fresno City College with our rising scholars. So we wanna help them, right, move past, but we won't, we're not allowed to hire them because of ed code. What steps can we take to start making changes for this? And Casey Taylor is also doing a session mm -hmm. later on on navigating barriers to uh, re-entry and I'm sure she she'll touch on that but since we have you here yes well I think so one of the other critical um, things for me um, not only just in education but I think in any any part of our lives because like I said um, impacted and formerly incarcerated students lives happen on campus as well as off campus is policy um, so I I think I think with when we when we talk about some of the policies, if we have a policy that says that you can't hire, so I, you can educate me and you cannot turn around and hire me, that's a problem. That's a policy issue. And what I know about policy is that policies can be challenged and changed, right? So, um, uh, so, so I say that that's something that if we, um, if, if if we if that that's something that as as you know, rising scholars as we, as we as we move on and we look at what is important for the students that are in, engaged in that program, that's a policy that we definitely need to demand a change for. Because what we know historically is that change won't happen unless you demand it. And so um, it, and so yeah, you, you have Casey Taylor who's incredible. Um, and there's a lot of other um, um, legal advocates that can help facilitate some of you know some of those conversations. And how do we address that? But California is a good space to start that. Um, I have to say, I came from Nevada, and and um, the and and um, California has been a, a good space to be able to challenge, and um, you know, and start making changes on some of these policies that are creating a lot of collateral consequences for people. So people want to say, okay, you know, it's your past, leave it behind, but Every step you take, it's right there, um, structurally. Um, so, so those are things we have to address. Um, the school of social work. I'm a social worker. Um, school of social work, uh, you know, is a, is a big issue. Is uh, I I create different placements for students right now because if they are impacted, um, you know, uh, in certain places they can't get their they can't go and get their experiential treat. Um, like that's discriminatory. And the profession is missing out on some incredible phenomenal human beings. Well, our Q&A has filled up, so that's exciting. <laughs> Similar to our trans allies, are there identified individuals on campus 
for our justice students that may not necessarily be rising scholars? Ray? Read, read that again, um, if you could, Susie, the last part. Similar to our trans allies, are there identified individuals on campus for our justice students that may not necessarily be rising scholars? I'm not sure if I'm, I'm getting that question. Uh, let me look at it. So is, I wanna make sure I'm understanding the, the question. Is the question about allies for rising scholars? Are there allies for the rising scholar students? So the anonymous like, attendee who posted the question, you can comment on your own question to give us a little bit more clarification if you'd like. Yeah, so if, I, so if I'm understanding uh, correctly, um, are, are there um, allies on campus that aren't necessarily um, carceral impacted or formally incarcerated? I think that's the question. And, and if it is, I hope, I hope I'm understanding. If not, please just correct me and let me know. If, but if I'm understanding the question correctly, yes, um, there are. Um, there, there are there are colleagues, there are faculty, um, there are classified professionals and administrators um, and students as well who are allies. Um, do we have a, an official bona fide ally program on campus? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, and we we've, we've been intentional. Um, it, it's really a, a network. It's a community. Um, and, and those allies know uh, who each other is. Um, I can't say that categorically, um, but your question, it also makes me think about the, the work, more of the work that we have to do, uh, right, Dr. Little? And, yes. and making sure that our students know who those allies are. And um, th there are a lot, there are a lot. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see how many allies are on campus when we first got the grant and started the Rising um, Scholar programs almost two years ago. Um, we, we have several people on campus, um, but this is something that should be identifiable. This is, this is something that the students should know about, know who they can contact. Um, so you're giving me a lot to think about, um, anonymous attendee, and I very much appreciate it. <laughs> and G had a question in the Q&A, but I'm going to uh, let him ask it uh, live. G should be able to unmute. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, I uh, am interested in finding out if you are aware of any successful programs that Fresno City College or colleges can implement while uh, our prospective students are in the system so we can accelerate their journey towards success. And as they are pretty much in other ways, we can build pathways from the system to our system so it's a seamless journey for them and we can support them before even they are released from the system. Exactly, that's a very good question. Ray, you wanna get that one also? No, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so it, again, not, not a one answer response, <laughs> but um, there, there's many um, programs and resources out there um, that are underway. Um, in terms of, of how you know, how good they are or how effective they are, um, you know, we, we don't know a whole lot about yet in terms of the community college system, right? Um, the, the programs are relatively new, but here's a beautiful thing um, in G, excellent question. Um, there, are, there are practices and there are services that exist on Fresno City College campus and throughout the California Community College system that we know work, right? We know that there are practices and services, um, maybe not a program per se, but I'm a big believer in that people are what define programs, right? It's not the program that's gonna facilitate the success of minoritized and marginalized communities, it's the people, right? And so we have services and practices, we know that work. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Mark McNipp. Um, many of you on this call and this, uh, in this symposium are familiar with uh, Mark McNiff, a great colleague, um, but he, he engages in practices um, that are validating that are um, um, welcoming and inviting uh, for system impacted and formerly incarcerated students. And he's known for doing that work in the community, among the students, like word spreads. And so, you know, it's really also asking about what, what can we learn from existing practices 
that are are, are working right and so um I, I think that's something that we can do in in, in addition to looking at um some programs across the state because the rising scholars program the network it, it is relatively new and um some a lot of us are are um, learning how to Im implement these programs in a meaningful way um and um yeah i hope i, I answer that sufficiently well and the and fresno city college does have a bridge program with juvenile justice though so um because what he's asking is you know which is we talk about a lot the bridge because you know, people may may be taking college classes while they're incarcerated and how can do we have something that in the middle but i know that we've started with the juvenile justice system where we we you know they uh, where we have a bridge program going on um but the the community college as a whole i don't think fcc has anything in the prisons or jails yet uh, specifically not, not as of yet um we we did try to establish something with our local um county jail um that was a, a partnership that was not viable at the time of our conversation with officials um and uh, another uh, hurdle that we encountered early on in the implementation of this program dr pimentel and myself um discovered that uh, there are 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 state prisons that aren't in our service area or jurisdiction service area if you will right and so there there's again there's 170 community colleges and um there are community colleges who are within the service area of state prisons so that has been another hurdle right so um several colleges throughout the state you know the 50 colleges i mentioned and, and probably more that have the rising scholars program grant they have established mous with their service area um uh, facilities and so that is that has presented a challenge for us right so essentially it's like us going to other areas where um other community colleges have already established mous and they have their marketing and outreach services and even in even in in prison services that has been a little challenging for us but um it is something we continue to explore to see if we can we can get some footing in some of those areas yeah because that's and that's i think that's essential um with individuals that i've worked with who are who have who were taking college courses while they were incarcerated? That's there's a big gap because the technology is different. Um, you know, just taking that first step on campus. Um, so having that bridge would be um, essential. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think um, Project Rebound. I'm not sure if Jennifer can weigh in on that, but I'm not sure if they do something on their level. But I think that's really important. That's what that's. I think that's the biggest gap. Hi, sorry, Cassandra, I couldn't figure out if my speaker was on or not yet, and they just <laughs> unmuted me. So um, sure, yeah, we would be happy to weigh in on that. I mean, as far as the prison in reach goes, that is something that is integral to the Project Rebound uh, Consortium. So statewide, we do reach, we do in reach into the prisons. Um, I know it's a little different with the community colleges, like, for example, here in the Central Valley at Valley State Prison and CCWF, I know Merced Community College has the contract to go in and provide face to face college instruction. They also have a rising scholar at their community college, um, but we have students that aren't necessarily paroling to that area. We have students to parole and come home and, and come to Fresno City. So that's why uh, Project Rebound has uh, been intentional about reaching into the prisons and doing in reach into the prisons specifically so that we can work with our local community colleges and i, and I think that's um, goes towards what arnold was asking about other community colleges in this area so if we have a student that's paroling down towards uh porterville or college of sequoias or west hills another community college i mean we have such an amazing fantastic working relationship with fresno city um, we would also like to help other community colleges develop that same level of um, service to students paroling into their areas. And um, so uh, we do work uh, and do a lot of in reach into the prisons. And one of the things that we do is make students aware of the community colleges in, in their paroling area, because regardless of where they're housed in prison, they may be going anywhere else in the state. And so um because uh, well i think as rising scholars develops into a more statewide 
um, program, which it looks like, you know, the state of California is really pushing to get that developed with, with a lot of um, nonprofit <laughs> help yeah. and assistance. Um, but it looks like we're finally moving in that direction. And I think once that happens and it becomes a more solidified state program, uh, that that we'll see a lot more presence of, of individuals and from the um, community colleges represented in prison in reach. Mm -hmm. And of course, Project Rebound is always happy once they do allow us to go back into the prisons uh, to bring students with us. And so, um, yeah, we'll definitely be working with uh, community college students as well as as Fresno State students to to do that in reach. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, you had a question in the Q&A. Would you like to ask that also? Oh, sure. Um, so I just wanted to uh, have you comment on, I know in my own work, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm program director for Project Rebound and uh, at Fresno State. And so I have in my role encountered on occasion naysayers that suggest that we don't belong on campuses and silly stuff like that, in my personal opinion, silly stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. but it is a reality that we do encounter naysayers at times that suggest that um, incarcerated education should not be happening and these types of programs should not be state funded. Um, and so I would just like you to weigh in on how you personally deal with that type of negativity when you encounter it so that you can assist other people on campus and give them some tools to work with in terms of how they might respond to people um, that don't directly support our programs. You go first, Ray, I'll go second. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, Jennifer, uh, th thank you for being here. It's uh, virtually see you. Um, Excellent question. Um, so the short answer is yes. I, I encounter um, uh, resistance, if you will, uh, frequently. In fact, it's it's the nature of my work. Um, you know, uh, as the director of equity and student success at Fresno City College, um, I have been advocating uh, for racial equity um, and anti-racism for for quite some time now. And in that work, I have encountered resistance along the way. But what I've also encountered along the way is a tremendous amount of support um, and a tremendous amount of um, leadership and, and backing from administrators, classified professionals, um, faculty, and community members alike. In a similar way, I've experienced the same thing with the Rising Scholars Program. And did we encounter resistance when we first received the Rising Scholars Program grant? Absolutely, yes. It is the nature of interrupting and disrupting forms of oppression, racism, and marginalization. It is the nature of the work, right? Um, but what has been helpful, what has been helpful is trying to work towards a critical mass, getting the, the right amount of colleagues, community members alike to rally behind this work, right? And support the work, that has what has sustained the effort, right? And so, yes, we've encountered resistance. And one thing that works well um, in my experience too with, with that resistance, right? Um, I, I learned this, um, you know, not right away in doing this work and, and that has um, helped me a lot. And that is calling people in versus calling people out, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, in the beginning, it was easy for me to call people out, right? <laughs> but what I have learned is I've learned how to, to empathetically, regardless of their experience and how different it may be from mine or the work that I am trying to promote for our college and community, I call people into the conversation and I want to know what, what, what are the dispositions of, of your resistance without saying that directly, right? What, what are the feelings and the sentiments that are rising with what you're saying, right, um, in contrast of the Rising Scholars Program? for racial equity and anti-racism work, right, in general, that my office does and promotes. So yes, we encounter it uh, constantly, um, and it's part of the work. Um, but, you know, it, it, as important as that question is, I, I, would, I would also just, you know, uh, invite us to think about focusing on um, the critical mass, right? The colleagues, the community members that rally behind this work, because that's really what, what works through the resistance. And something that one of my mentors, Dr. J. Luke Wood, instilled in me a long time ago is that you're always going to have at least a fourth, right? And that's, a, that's an approximate, right? But you're always going to have at least a fourth in an organizational culture of people who do not agree, believe, or see the value in the work that you're doing when it relates to equity. And so instead of focusing on that approximate fourth of people, 
who for whatever reason will not be engaged with the work or be interested, right? Focus on the other three fours. And mm -hmm. that's what I mean about the critical mass uh, with community members and colleagues. Like Dr. Little, when I say community, I'm talking about Dr. Little. Dr. Little has been a huge advocate and champion um, and she has helped me a lot with some of that resistance. So um, I'm, I'm gonna pass it to you, Dr. Little. I know you probably have a lot to well, say. Uh, well, and you said a big piece of it is the uh, focus on the, I don't focus on the, on the, that that quarter of the people who I'm not gonna, I don't go into changing people's minds. I'm just, that's just not the thing that I do. Um, but um, I do try to impact people's heart. Um, and we all, that's one thing we all have in common um, for the most part. And, um, you know, I always tell people is, you know, I'm unapologetically black. I walk in this space 110% of the time. And so I, um, I, I do just what Ray say, I invite people in um, to have that conversation and to challenge their fears um, and, and, and to be okay with that. Like I said, to be okay with, you know, be okay with being uncomfortable. Let's have an uncomfortable conversation. Um, and when we're talking about um, formerly incarcerated people, I, you know, before we used to have those conversations about, oh, nonviolent versus violent, I, I, it's like getting rid of all those kind of type of labels. Um, because I go back to it again, we're all neighbors. So I, if I, for me, I want all my neighbors to be um, educated, safe, um, be able to have a job, um, to be, you know, so I, so I think I look at it kind of in a communal way and, um, and that's how I approach people. And, and you're always gonna have resistance. Um, and, and, and what, you know, what resistance do and what it's done for me, it's just, uh, man, this made, it had me, it, it made me sharpen my tool. So, uh, so that's, and if you need, you need any other assistance with that, Jennifer, call me. I'll be there. Thank you, Dr. Little. Another question, do you feel mentors must have close shared experiences to be effective? As a former foster child with mm -hmm. family members who have been incarcerated, this is close to my heart, mm -hmm. but would I be an effective mentor? Most definitely. Proximity is, is, and proximity is on a range, right? So I, I think that there are certain aspects of the experience that um, you would be able to connect to that other people um, wouldn't. So I think, I think when we talk about mentors, that's on a range. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm a communal person. I, um, I, I feel that the many people we can circle around a, a person, the better that person chances um, are, right? So most definitely, um, you you have a you have a level of experience that no one else um, could would be able to share with that that individual as a mentor. So yes, give us your name, and we'll 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 get you we'll get you started. And you can post that uh, privately just to the panelists in the chat if you'd like to. Renee, I saw you had your hand raised and then you lowered it, but. Uh, I know you had a question yes, or you want to share funny. something with us. Thank you, Dr. Little, for such an informative presentation this morning. And uh, Dr. Ramirez, thank you as well for putting this, uh, this, this whole symposium together. Phenomenal, a phenomenal success, I believe, so far. I was able to participate yesterday as well. I wanted to mention, because I saw um, quite a few uh, comments regarding allied programs and um, and um, other outreach services. And I want to mention that Fresno City College is partnered with Focus Forward, a nonprofit in the community yes. that is currently supporting a phenomenal grant um, with regards to moving uh, youth from uh, the, the current situation at Alice Worsley High School on the juvenile justice campus in Fresno to Fresno City College, either as a dual enrollment student or ultimately as a regular college, uh, college student at Fresno City College. And um, to that end, um, a matter of fact, um, Dr. Tiffany White spoke about her experience there. And I'd like to say that the, the partnership between Fresno City and Focus Forward was a very innovative one. Both yes. Dr. Pimentel and uh, Dr. Ramirez were very 
uh, much responsible for putting that together with the nonprofit. And so kudos to, to Fresno City under their leadership, because as of today, uh, they have accomplished 75 students at Alice Worsley High School for the first time in history to complete dual enrollment uh, classes. Uh, so round of applause, um, super excited about that. And we have our first uh, cohort this year going through the ranks um, as regular college students. So um, we're really looking forward to continuing to strengthen that partnership. And again, I just wanna put a shout out to the leadership in place. Uh, I'm, I'm honored and, and thrilled to serve in that capacity as well to support the process. And um, I just wanna to, want to say that everything that you're saying is just so on point when it comes to our students of color. And um, I know for a fact, you know, I can see the success taking place uh, that these partnerships do work and they do matter and they do change the cycle um, that we're trying to break with exactly. our youth. And so um, thank you for, for allowing me to share that. Thank you, Renee, that's, that's critical. Casey Taylor says, thank you, Dr. Little. You spoke of women who support loved ones who are cur currently incarcerated mm -hmm. and women is with an X. Mm -hmm. What can we do to support students who are severely impacted by the system through a loved one if they are a provider and caretaker for their partner who is currently incarcerated with extreme financial and emotional costs? Well, thank you for that loaded question, Casey. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a, that's a major issue and that's, that's something that we've, um, talked about extensively is that the, the women's um, responsibility is so, um, I don't know, it just goes on and on and on. And, and that's one of the, the places I think, especially on the, particularly on the community, I'm saying Fresno City College is that we have to keep in mind that, the, that they, they are, when we say impacted, that's why we stretched our, our definition um, for rising scholars. We, we had a conversation about that, that is not just um, students who have been um, incarcerated, but also who have been system impacted, who are taking care of people who are um, who are incarcerated, because as we know, the cost um, is extensive. You, you got to pay for phone calls if you want to continue the relationships with um, a, a, you know a, a loved one who's in there. You got a um, commissary, um, all, you know, just ongoing um, visitation. The, all the costs are intense. So I think if, I think we have to keep in mind to create some type of um, funding to help those students meet those needs also when we're, when we're talking about um, supports for women um, who are impacted on campus. It's not just women who have been incarcerated themselves but are caring for incarcerated members. And the same with legal. Um, and, and we've talked about this um, before too, is that a lot of times um, they're maneuvering the legal aspects because of the once if you have a loved one who's incarcerated, they are cut off from the world. So you are their world. You are their connection. You're their bridge to the world and um, access to legal um, for for um, women who are caring for um, someone who is incarcerated um, is is essential. So being able to have someone to refer them to and having those supports out in the community and knowing the supports that are in the community is essential. We have three more questions in the Q&A, and I think that's just exactly what we have time for. Okay. Tabitha, yeah. one of our deans says, early in the, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned 60% of women in prison have children under the age of 18. Heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Are there local organizations that support these women and children? What are the most crucial physical and emotional needs for the women, children, and their families? Oh gosh, that's a big question. I may need a little bit of help here, but um, in regards to local organizations, yes, there's there are local there are local organizations that, um, you know, help that you know their their goal is to help women who are, um, and families, but you know I I want you know I want to say that a lot of those are fund, you know, grant funded. And what we know is that when grants are gone out, they're gone. So there's not, 
I don't want I and someone can tell me if I'm wrong, but there's not a lot of programs that are, that is their main focus and um, they're intentional about it. And so that, you know, that that part is challenging. And what was the second part of that question, Susie? What are the most crucial physical and emotional needs? Um, needs? Well, if you have a, if it's a, a parent that is incarcerated, I, I say visitations um, with, with their children when that's possible. Um, now, I don't know, like in regards to Central Valley, I have to, I have to say, I don't know um, what kind of services are out there, but I know um, nationally there's been a, there's a push for making sure that um, kids, there's organizations that make sure kids have access to visitations, they will take them to visit their parents um, so that those relationships stay in place. I think for women that are incarcerated, that's essential, that's their main, the, the parenting, you don't stop being a parent once you're incarcerated. Um, actually that need intensifies, right? So um, so I, I say that, that keeping that bond is, is critical um, once, while they're incarcerated. And once they re-enter, just having, that, having the, um, the ability, the uh, easy way to reunify. And you know, I, I, like I said, I was part of the child welfare system for a long time and it's a tough, that's, that system is just as tough as the criminal justice system. Like I said, I reserve the right to critique um, I've been a part of both of them um, because, and my critique is just so I want them to be better. Um, is that um, a lot of systems with that that are female focused can be very abusive and dismissive, and um, and so it's a you know it's a it's it's really a t I, we got to find a better way to help mothers and and their kids reunify. Um, when when at all possible and make that make that transition a little easier for both parties. Right, and for our community. Thank you, and I posted in the chat, if anybody in the room, there's 68 of you out there, knows of any support to share with it, all of us, please go ahead and drop those resources in the chat. I'll be sharing the chat along with the recording. Yeah. Uh, another question, typically admissions or office staff are the first points of contact when people are inquiring about entering college. Aside from events like this, what other steps are being taken to inform and educate office staff to be sensitive to the needs of formerly incarcerated individuals? And I just wanna say Marianne Valentino has posted that we are doing our RAM racial equity labs and this will specifically be addressed in those, but Dr. Little or Dr. Ramirez, if you could. Ray, you will let you handle that one. Yeah, that and that um, that was about the Ram Racial Equity Lab. Is that what you were saying, Susie? Marianne said Ra Ram Racial Equity Labs will address this, but this person wants to know what other steps are being taken to inform and educate office staff to be sensitive to the needs of our rising scholars. Yeah, excellent question. So um, certainly, the symposium is is one effort to um, inform classified professionals, faculty administrators, right? On how to work with and better meet the needs of carceral impacted and formerly incarcerated students. But um, this is just a, one symposium. And uh, to Marianne's point, um, we have what's called the RAM Racial um, Equity Lab. And um, that is a, it's really a, a, an off, a spin off of our original interdisciplinary faculty equity lab. And in those RAM Racial Equity Labs, um, I forget what the number is, correct me if I'm wrong, Marianne, but we're going to have approximately 150 to 160 faculty classified professionals and administrators that are going to go through a semester long training next fall and spring, intensive training um, that centers equity mindedness, uh, racial equity and anti-racism. And to Dr. Little's point yesterday morning and today, campuses can't have a conversation about equity without first considering the intersecting identities of formerly incarcerated people on campus, right? And so that's something that's gonna be um, a topic and discussion I, I know will be in, in um, Marianne's um, facilitation of the RAM Racial Equity Lab. Dr. Marianne Valentino is our, our lead faculty facilitator for those RAM Racial Equity Labs, but um, it doesn't stop there. Um, we had some conversations in our Equity Leadership Academy um, which was a, a six month, um, which is, we're in it right now, 
it's a six month intensive um, uh, learning experience for every administrator at Fresno City College to learn how to lead for racial equity and promote equity mindedness across the campus. And, and remembering that what Dr. Little touched on, you can't talk about equity and, 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 and exclude system impact and forming incarcerated people into the conversation. And although we had some conversations and some breakout sessions in those equity leadership academies, it wasn't a central focus. So what does that mean? Yes, we certainly have more work to do. Um, we've made some inroads in, in getting the message out there, but um, we, we have a lot more work to do. And that's the beautiful thing about this work is it's ongoing. It is ongoing and ongoing. And, and I'll stop at that. I think there's a couple other people who wanted to talk. Maria, did you want to add anything to that? I'm guessing not. <laughs> oh, I thought I had unmuted myself. Oh, that's that why I was like, I wonder if she's muted. <laughs> yeah, I thought I pressed that button. Um, if all of the cohorts fill for the entire year, academic year, there will be 248 participants that go through the RAM Racial Equity Lab. Thank you. And our final question from Susan Chandler. In my classes, ICE detentions and deportations and fear greatly impact students. Mm. Does rising scholars include ICE detentions as incarceration? Or do you work with organizations on campus focused on those issues? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, we have not come across students in our program yet um, who have uh, experienced um, those um, systems, uh, those traumatic systems, oppressive systems. Um, but I, I, I made note of that as soon as Susie was reading it because we uh, we haven't uh, we haven't defined a rising scholar or formerly incarcerated to, to one item, right? It's multifaceted, and that's something I've definitely learned throughout this symposium, right? And I hope you all have as well. Um, but uh, that's something we should uh, consider, uh, especially during these trying times. Um, I think that's going to be increasingly important. So um, thank you for that question, because that's given us a lot more to think about. And that concludes all our questions. And that means we're just about out of time. Thank so you. close it out for us, Dr. Little, Dr. Dr. Ray. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for um, the engagement. The questions really um, help and, and they, they really, like I said, any kind of questions help us refine what we're doing. We're, we're, we are really passionate about wanting to create a space for that leaves no one out of the conversation. Um, like I said, today, my talk was intentional um, and, and speaking about the experience of women, um, because a lot of times that, that conversation is left out. Um, we do have trans community we, we need to engage more in. And so this is the, the thing that I love is that the work will, it does not end. And we need everyone's help to, to make sure that, um, you know, that no one is left out of these conversations. So um, I just wanna say thanks again for participating and, and um, engaging me in the, in this topic and please continue to enjoy the um, symposium and be okay with you know, asking uncomfortable questions, making uncomfortable comments. And um, thank you and we'll, we'll see you again at the end.